Combating Global Poverty, next on International Focus. The Institute of World Affairs at UWM and Milwaukee Public Television present International Focus, a global magazine linking Wisconsin and the world. Welcome to International Focus. I'm Robert Sigliano, Director of the Institute of World Affairs at UWM. Over the last 20 years, many humanitarian crises have taken a positive turn. Some of the most horrific armed conflicts have subsided or ended. Worldwide, the number of refugees is half what it was at the end of the Cold War. Hundreds of millions have been lifted out of poverty. Yet, over one billion people on the planet still struggle simply to survive. Progress has been made, but freeing the world's most vulnerable citizens from poverty and despair will require more concerted multilateral effort. The task is daunting, but many frontline practitioners believe it can be done. To help us explore the possibility of a world without hunger, we're very pleased to be joined by a global champion in the battle against human suffering. Jan Egelan currently serves as Director General of the Norwegian Institute of International Affairs. He is remembered worldwide as the public face of the United Nations, directing UN responses to some of the world's most challenging humanitarian crises as Undersecretary General for Humanitarian Affairs. Time Magazine recently named him one of the 100 most influential people of our time, dubbing him the world's conscience. Jan Egelin, welcome to International Focus. Thank you for having me. Um, so, Jan, I, you, you, you've tried to sum up your experiences in, in both at the UN uh, in, as uh, Director of Humanitarian Affairs, but also as the envoy to Colombia and your work with the Norwegian Foreign Ministry and the Red Cross into the book A Billion Lives. And, and I'm wondering if you could... Um, Give us a short summary of how you, you tackled such a, what your argument is in that, in that book, which is tackling such a big problem. The reason I decided to write the book was that when I gave my goodbye interviews in the UN building in New York, having been to all of these wars and disaster areas, the journalists from all over the world basically had one initial question, all of them, do you leave depressed or do you leave very depressed? And my answer was that I have obviously not gotten across by summing up my experience because I left an optimist. I've seen too many places where we actually succeeded instead of fail to, to become a pessimist. We can do fantastic things in this generation as we were proving in the largest natural disaster areas in all of the wars that we in the United Nations helped end. Uh, of course, still there is more than a billion people who will go to bed hungry tonight, who will not have had access to clean drinking water, and who will have to str struggle to survive on less than a dollar a day tomorrow. And that's why I called the book A Billion Lives, because it signals there is still a lot of unfinished business, even though we have made some progress. In, 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 in making that progress, I, I imagine that the trend lines uh, are generally positive, when you, as measured by many ind indicators, whether it's numbers of refugees or, or people living under less than a, a dollar a day, say. Um, now we've kind of hit a bit of a wall with the financial crisis, the financial meltdown, not just in the United States, but, but, but globally. Um, are, we at a, are, are, are we about to see a downturn now with those trends, or do you, do you think we can keep the progress where it is? Well, it certainly is a fork in the road now. It could go either way. We could continue making progress. Uh, new, uh, some of the existing wars could end. Uh, and we would, uh, we would uh, continue the trend line, which is from 65 wars and armed conflicts to 32 today, just over the last 15 years. Half as many people live on less than a dollar a day now as in 1980, etc. However, the financial meltdown is certainly bad news for the top billion richest people in the world, but it's even worse news for the bottom billion, less public uh, assistance, less private giving is clearly uh, in indicated, less investment in 
the third world because investors would go to their safe home markets and uh, on top of that decreasing commodity prices for those things that the south the third world countries can sell us at the same time the food prices for the poorest people will remain high because that is really linked to the world population which is growing and everybody has to eat although we can cut back on many other things and uh, the, 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 those at the top uh, I, 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 I've, from what I've, I've read and heard you talk about that there is a, a, a there are billions of us who are doing much much better and even though our prospects in the near future or, or near mid future midterm are not as bright as perhaps they were three months ago um, is do we have the capacity even di or did we have the capacity even before the meltdown to, to help deal with that that bottom billion poor absolutely people? we had the capacity before and we will have the capacity afterwards listen if if the world was willing to give as much to this historic battle against disease uh, lack of education uh, lack of food for the poorest on the planet we were willing to give as much to that as the United States have been investing alone as one country in one country alone Iraq we could fix it uh, the U.S. Is, is going to, to be spending at least $140 billion this year in Iraq, as last year and the year before. Uh, total global assistance is less than that. To, to all 100 countries that receive assistance from all those 30, 40, 50 donors who give assistance, just to show the, the proportions there, it's a question of political will. It's a, it's a question of priorities. There is more than enough among the three billion who are well off or extremely well off to lift up that one to two billion who are living in abject poverty. The, um, uh, there's so many directions I want, I want to go with this, but, but I want to look at some cases where there has been that political war where you've seen that political will actually take shape and, and be implemented successfully and and cases where it hasn't or where it's it's lacking and and so maybe starting on the lacking side um mm. if we look at at, at darfur uh, and a situation that um the bush administration has called the genocide under under the first uh bush administration um yet people are still suffering still dying the international effort is still lagging what's happened with that effort the effort is ongoing and successfully so in one area alone and that is the humanitarian one the people that i saw the first time in refugee camps i think you have an, an image of that in 2004 are still in the same refugee camps now in 2008 only there are many more in dire straits they do get food uh, generally, they, ha they get primary education and they do get uh, primary health care. But they get no protection. They are, uh, uh, they are uh, attacked, raped, plundered, uh, abused by armed men still. And they are mostly women and children living in these camps. So it's, it, it, here's one of the, my, my basic questions. How come that you know, 40 years after man walked on moon, we are not able to protect women and children. When we know where they are, we know how their uh, uh, abuses are. And it's, it's again a question of uh, m man not doing enough to protect human, uh, human beings elsewhere. Uh, what should be done? Well much more pressure on those who can influence the government of Sudan but also on the guerrillas who can influence the government of Sudan China India Pakistan Malaysia the biggest Asian trading partners Arab countries who are closely politically and culturally linked to the regime who can influence the the guerrillas which are also doing bad things well 
the U.S., the Europeans, Eritrea, uh, neighbors, Chad, all have to come together to influence the parties to make right choices and not continue making the wrong choices. Well, is it a, is it a question of certain countries, say the United States or China, um, not doing the right things, or is it the lack of what you're referring to there is sort of that more that broader multilateral effort? Well, it's, it's both. The broader multilateral effort is lacking because the member states of the UN are not, are not supporting the UN. I mean, the UN uh, finally was allowed to put a peacekeeping force into Darfur years too late. And when finally it, we get the permission to do so, there is not enough troops from troop-contributing countries. The world is not even able to provide the, 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 the few helicopters that are needed for this force in a situation where the U.S. and other countries have declared genocide. I mean, it's supposed to be all people to the pumps here uh, and helping to save uh, this, the, 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 these people, and we're not. Certainly... Uh, the, 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 those countries who really could influence, uh, like China, have done far too little. Daf uh, I think Darfur is an, is an interesting case also of the West having less influence than we thought we had. I mean, I brought this to the Security Council. I brought it to the CNN and the BBC and so on, a lot of attention. I thought that if we woke up Washington and London and Brussels and so on, we could fix it. We couldn't. Because the West was not able, even though it tried to influence the Sudanese government, we should have gone earlier on to Beijing and New Delhi and Moscow and others and said, this problem, you fix it because you are the biggest investors in Sudan and the West is unable, seemingly. Have we got to a point in, in Darfur, and we have just a couple minutes before our, our break, and I, I promise you we'll get to the positive examples, mm. um, but, but if you look at situations like Darfur or Zimbabwe, uh, have they become intractable problems that we will not be able to deal with? No, they're not intractable problems, although they are extremely difficult and uphill, and they're worse problems today than they were three, four years ago. If the world had been, if the UN had been able to muster enough coherent efforts three, four years ago, we could have ended Darfur, much more difficult today. Um, Zimbabwe should have been ended as an atrocity brought, up, inflicted upon the people of Zimbabwe by their own leaders, Mugabe and his cronies in this uh, ZANU party. South Africa should have done much more vis-a-vis uh, -vis Zimbabwe earlier. Uh, another case of in a way, the wrong countries push the right issue. UK, US has pushed the right issues in Darfur, in Zimbabwe, in Burma, but it was China and India and South Africa and the ASEAN neighbors of Burma who could have done more. So I see in the future much more of a campaign saying we have to find out who's able to lead this and those have to be pushed. Well, well, we'll come back after our break, and I want to, I want to, as I said, turn to, to a positive example, and particularly the role of the UN in doing that. To our viewers, uh, International Focus, we'll be back in just a moment. The Institute of World Affairs presents our community with a range of public programs relating to global issues, U.S. foreign policy, and the world economy. For more information about the Institute of World Affairs, call 414 229-3220 or visit our website at www.iwa.uwm.edu Welcome back to International Focus. We're talking with Jan Egelon, Director General of the Norwegian Institute of International Affairs and former UN Undersecretary General for Humanitarian Affairs, and as your subtitle of your book says, an eyewitness to the front lines of, of, of humanity. And we've been talking about some of those, those humanitarian and, and political conflict issues. Um, Jan, the, w w there are some stark positive examples, too, from your time. Uh, at the UN. Can you talk some about um, what you see as, as some of the examples of what we can do when, when the UN and the international community is really focused on an issue? Yeah, let me pick the example of, of the Indian Ocean tsunami uh, as, an ex as an example of how this generation can do miracles if we, 
if we come together and use the logistics and the resources that we have at hand. We woke up, I woke up uh, to a phone call at 6 a.m. on the second day of Christmas, and the news was that a tsunami, which is a gigantic wave triggered by an, a sub-oceanic earthquake, had struck 12 countries around the Indian Ocean, Asia and even all, all the way over to Africa. You know, at, at that point, uh, I think previous generations would have given up doing, g g getting to people quickly. There was no co lines of communication, there was no transport available locally, everything was a mess. But over Christmas and New Year's, we organized a, an aid operation that involved 90 countries. 35 countries, including the U.S., gave military logistics that basically made people survive those who had not been killed by the first seconds of the giant wave. Nearly, nearly anybody, uh, or, or rather nobody died from uh, starvation or disease caused by lack of assistance. It was humanity at our best when nature was at its worst. There are many such uh, examples. I mean, we, we just spoke about Darfur. I mean, certainly it's an achievement that the UN has a thousand trucks there helping to provide more than half a million tons of food every year, much of that American food that keep people alive. So, it is as remarkable what we can achieve, like in the Indian Ocean tsunami, where everything was rebuilt and, uh, you know, uh, Bill Clinton, the former president, was uh, our envoy to help rebuild uh, all of this, uh, this uh, tsunami-stricken uh, areas. It's amazing how much we can do there and how little we do in some of the forgotten emergencies. And that's why I'm calling for more predictability in our international assistance. There has to be more general funds where our field workers can say, listen, here in the Congo we have a horrific war that gets no attention and no funding. We need to take from this central emergency fund that we, I helped create and which has actually now um, channeled a billion dollars to forgotten and neglected emergencies. So yet again, a sign of progress on our watch. Uh, and, and one led by, by, by the UN. And it, it sounded from, from your descriptions of those, those stories, timing is critical in terms of how you get this. The, the extent of the multilateral engagement mm -hmm. is critical. But I, I, it felt like those two things are hand in hand. In other words, the, the earlier you can get in to deal with one of these situations, maybe the easier it is to get that kind of multilateral Absolutely. effort. Um, and and uh, the and the what is how how should the UN be used? I mean, there's enough to talk about what it maybe not is working at the UN, but how should the UN be used? Well, I think the UN needs to become now for this new American president the place where the U.S. leads in multilateral cooperation, just like in the tsunami, like in the uh, South Asian earthquake, or for that matter in Liberia, where, and this is the positive example of what happened during President Bush. I mean, there, are, there are low points like Iraq, which, where the U.S. went alone with a few allies against the advice of the rest of the world, basically. But let's take a positive example. In Liberia, the U.S. saw, like everybody else of us, a terrible civil war, and that it, it could be helped by the neighboring countries coming in with soldiers to end it, but also a, a UN integrated mission, as we call it, where there are peacekeeping soldiers and there are development people, humanitarian people, environment people, and, and democracy workers helping with elections. All of that happened. In the course of three years, the country went from horrific civil war to basically becoming a democracy with a wonderful female elected president, Ellen Sirleaf Jones, who I believe have been here in Milwaukee. This uh, president 
came as the culmination of a successful UN process that the US led. US paid 26% of the $1 billion a year that it cost, $260 million. The US part of the bill equals 10 hours of expenses this year in Iraq. That, that, that's, uh, when we're talking about the money growing shorter, but a story like that in terms of the, the efficiency of the funds being spent in something like Liberia versus, say, in Iraq, how is the UN able to you know, be that multiplier effect to, 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 to um, create a lot of value for a limited amount of resources? Well, for, for many reasons. One is that we get, we get many nations to cooperate uh, when a, the 17,000 soldiers went to Liberia, they came from African countries, Asian countries, Latin American countries. The cost per soldier is a fraction of what an American or a Norwegian soldier costs us in, in the field. Um, the, the costs are borne by the troop contributing country and by the common UN fund for the operation. At the same time as the UN is very cost efficient in uh, developmental operations, in humanitarian operation, typically we would have you know, a few international people directing and leading hundreds of local employees. So, so it's cost efficient at the same time as it has a lot of legitimacy. It's not the West coming in to fix the Muslim Arab world. It is the world fixing a corner of the world. Yeah. Um, so we've, we've got a few minutes left, and I, I want to give you your sort of final exam here to pull this all, all, all together. So we have the UN. We have a new American uh, administration uh, uh, coming in. We have uh, uh, long-term difficult issues, and in particularly an area of the world we really haven't talked about much, which is the Middle East. Mm -hmm. Where, where there is a lot of anger, a lot of uh, social injustice, and so on. How do you pull all the, would you pull all these things together? If you were the Secretary of State and the, the new administration, how would you think of using the UN of, of, and of dealing with this very difficult part of the world? Well, what I, I hope uh, and I believe is that the new president will really say, <laughs> listen, world, we have a joint problem here. We have a joint problem here in the Israeli-Palestinian conflict which is creating so much anger and frustration far beyond Jerusalem as such. It's become a symbol for, for a, a burning injustice all over the world basically. So let's come together and look at it and we, the US, will help lead this effort in the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. I think the whole world is looking to the United States because of the unique relationship between the United States and Israel, which is, you know, at the core of the whole effort to solve it, really. Uh, but, it, but in all of these uh, efforts, it has to be countries coming together. Iraq will never be stable, never ever be stable, unless the region be believes and understands the importance of having a stable Iraq. At the moment, uh, we, as we as we speak, we've heard of uh, you know f uh, even fighting at the border between uh, Syria and, and Iraq. It has all possibilities of becoming a regional conflict, but it could also become a regional peace process. Same for Afghanistan. The new president will have more problems in Afghanistan than even in Iraq. That's my prediction. Unless there is a regional process and a global effort that is less Western and Westernized, uh, we will not succeed in Afghanistan. Uh, all of this points in the direction of the U.S. doing more multilateral work, more U.N. work, more leading the world in consultation and in dialogue and saying, we have a common problem, let's, let's meet it together. Uh, you said at the outset of the show that you left the UN uh, as an optimist. I take it you're still an optimist. Is there what what keeps you optimistic? Well, what keeps me optimistic is is the progress I've seen: more peace, less absolute poor, uh, less epidemic disease, um, more children in school, more girls in school, 
and more countries coming on their feet, less dictatorship, more democracy. So uh, what, what I think is very important is that the, the Americans as the Europeans and others who, who have a lot of resources that can be used for good in the world do not despair now, especially in these times of, of, of economic crises, and say, we've, we've been able to do so much in our generation. What cannot the new generation coming in, they have more resources, better technology, better organizations, including the UN, than anybody before them. Jan Englan, uh, the Norwegian Institute of International Affairs and formerly Undersecretary General for Humanitarian Affairs, thank you very much for being with us. And to our viewers, we'll see you next week on International Focus. information about the Institute of World Affairs and its many programs, or to become a member of the Institute, call 414-229-3220, or visit us at our website, 